Going to the doctor or to a hospital for a medical issue is nerve-wracking enough, but how likely are you to be misdiagnosed? And are there any clues that you may have had a misdiagnosis? Well, here with more details is Dr. Dimitri Alden, a cancer surgeon at Lenox Hill Hospital. Dr. Alden, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. So you say that in their lifetimes, most Americans will get at least one misdiagnosis. Is that right? That's correct. So how many happen a year, and do any of these lead to death? Absolutely. There's a huge number of errors that goes throughout the country. And it says that about 5% or 1 in 10 diagnoses are wrong today, which leads to a whole sequence of events. And we have to really break the wrong diagnosis concept down. And sort of the way I look at it, it's three possible scenarios mm -hmm. is no care, unnecessary care, or wrong care. And all three of these events can trigger either complications right. or absolutely unnecessary care and unnecessary expenditure to the health. Absolutely. So what about the move to electronic medical records? Wasn't that supposed to help alleviate this problem? Yes. The intent was the, indeed to eliminate the problem, to prevent medication errors, to prevent errors in diagnosis and so forth. But we have to remember one thing. We are treating humans, and computers cannot treat humans. Humans have to treat humans. And also, computer systems are dependent on the input of information or data entry. Right. So what is at the root of these errors? Is it all miscommunication? Many factors. And again, coming back to the human concept, it highly depends on who is seeing the patient, what information is transmitted. Is the doctor seeing the patient first, or is the mid-level practitioner seeing the patient first, or is it the nurse? What condition the doctor is in? Is he well rested? Has he slept? Has he had a good day? It, all, these, all these things affect. So this is all scary information. What can I, as a patient, do to protect myself? Do you recommend always getting a second opinion? Not always. I think to protect yourself, the, you have to really communicate with the doctor. And it's very important because as physicians, we commonly run into patients who, what we call them in medical lingo, poor historians, meaning that the patient does not communicate the important information. Uh. For instance, if someone is coming to the emergency room and had taken Advil, a commonly used medication everywhere in, in the United States and around the world, and it's very helpful to treat pain, but the side effect of it is bleeding. And if that is not communicated to the physician, this is not going to be m in the computer. Mm -hmm. The nurse will not know. And the next doctor, next consultant who is treating the patient may not find out about that. And that could lead to an error or bleeding in the upper ear. So patients have to take a certain amount of responsibility for knowing their own medical history and being able to communicate that as well, correct? The patients have to communicate, and mm -hmm. the patients have to ask questions. I really recommend right. asking questions. I think if you have a complex diagnosis, in my field, I'm a liver cancer surgeon, that these are really complex cases that we deal with. I always encourage my patients to get a second opinion, to have another look. Okay, and so are there any clues that you may have a misdiagnosis? Is there anything you can point to, any suspicions that you might want to follow through on? Well, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's right? hard. It, it depends. It depends on your condition. If it's a simple common cold, versus a cancer diagnosis. Those things right. are complex. Right. Be careful and just know your history as well as possible, right? And ask questions. Absolutely. All right, Dr. Alden, thank you so much for thank that. Thank you.